After the death of Ehud and Shamgar, Israel once more did evil in the sight of the Lord. This time, when the children of Israel cried out to God for help, he gave them two women, Deborah and Yael. Deborah, as judge over Israel, orchestrated the battle to deliver Israel, and Yael killed the opposing general. The account of Deborah and Yael is told in two parallel accounts. The first account in Judges chapter 4 is the narrative of the events. The second account in chapter 5 is the song of victory written in poetical form. The song written in the feminine first-person singular originates from Deborah, although both her and her general Barak are said to have sung the song. It is the second song of this type recorded in the Bible. The first one is the song of the sea that Moses and Miriam sang after God brought them safely across the Red Sea. How did God use these two women to defeat the Canaanite king Jabin, ruler of the city of Hazor? Why is this victory like the victory at the Red Sea commemorated in song? I'm Brenda Cathcart, and this is The Promise of Rest. The enemy that God allowed to rise up and subjugate the Israelites this time was a Canaanite from within the land of Israel. Jabin was the king of Hazor. Judges 4, 1 and 2. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harosheth Hagoyim. The city of Hatzor was north of the Sea of Galilee in the Jordan Valley located on the major trade route connecting Canaan to Mesopotamia. Before Joshua led the conquest of the Promised Land over 150 years earlier, Hatzor was by far the largest city in Canaan. Hatzor controlled the entire upper region of the Promised Land. The tribal lands of Asher, Naphtali, Zebulun, and East Manasseh were most affected by Jabin. The Song of Deborah describes how Jabin harassed the Israelites in the land. Judges 5, 6 through 8. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Yael, the highways were deserted, and travelers went by roundabout ways. The peasantry ceased, they ceased in Israel, until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen, then war was in the gate. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Israel had gone after other gods, and when Jabin attacked, Israel either didn't have weapons or their weapons were totally ineffective against Jabin. Deborah's song states that among 40,000 in Israel, none of them raised a shield or spear against Jabin. Jabin oppressed the children of Israel for 20 years. When the children of Israel cried out to God, God had already placed Deborah in the position of judge over Israel. Judges 4, 4 and 5. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time, and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Deborah's seat of government was in the tribal lands of Ephraim, far south of the region controlled by Jabin. Deborah was a different kind of judge than usual. Deborah described herself as a mother in Israel. This places her firmly among the other mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. She is the only female judge, as well as the only judge said to have been a prophet or prophetess. The typical judge set up in the gates of a city where the people brought their disputes to be settled. Deborah, however, set up under a date palm tree. The date palm was the major source of sweetener or date honey in this area of the world. The other source of honey is, of course, the honeybee. It just so happens that Deborah's name, number 1683 in Strong's Concordance, means bee. The root word is debar, number 1696, meaning to arrange, but most often translated as word or speech. 
Deborah, as a prophetess of God, set up under the source of honey in the promised land and dispensed the sweetness of God's judgments. The psalmist compares God's judgments to honey. Psalms 19, 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Although Yael does not come into the story until later, the meaning of her name connects to Deborah's name. Yael, number 3278, means ibex or mountain goat. She feeds Sisera, Jabin's general, milk, which is probably goat milk. So Deborah and Yael together provide the honey and the milk of the promised land. God repeatedly told the children of Israel that the land he was giving them was a land flowing with milk and honey. When the children of Israel came to Deborah for deliverance, she sent for Barak, the general of the armies of Naphtali, the tribal land most affected by Jabin. She even provided the battle plan, Judges 4, 6, and 7. And she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun? And I will draw Sisera to you, the captain of Jabin's army, at the river Kishon, together with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into your hands. The meaning of Barak's name also adds to our understanding of this situation. His name, number 1301, means lightning or flashing sword. In David's song of praise for God's victory in 2 Samuel 22:15, he includes the lightning bolt, Barak, as one of God's weapons. Deborah summons Barak to be God's weapon and flashing sword. Although being God's weapon would have been sufficient for Barak to have victory over Sisera, his chariots, and his gathered multitude, Barak demanded that Deborah go with him to battle. We don't know if Barak lacked faith or felt unworthy of the honor, but he wouldn't go into battle without Deborah, the prophetess of God, with him. As a result, credit for the victory would go to Deborah and Yael, Judges 4.9. So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. Barak and Deborah traveled from her palm tree near Bethel to Kedesh. There they gathered 10,000 men from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. Immediately after this, we learn that Abar, the Kenite, had camped near the city of Kedesh. Judges 4.11 Now Abar the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zaanaim, which is beside Kedesh. Eber was a descendant of Moses' father-in-law Jethro, although Jethro was called Hobab in this verse. When Israel crossed over the Jordan River and entered the Promised Land, Jethro made a covenant with Israel and lived among them. However, Eber broke this covenant and separated himself from the other Kenites. As the Israelite army traveled south to Mount Tabor to take up the battle as God had planned, someone, possibly Eber, informed Sisera about the movement of Israel's army. Deborah said she would draw Sisera's army to the place of her choosing. Perhaps she deliberately allowed Eber to pass along this information to Sisera. So Sisera gathered his own army. Judges 4, 12 and 13. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him, from Harosheth Hagayim to the river Kishon. This verse indicates that Sisera's army was huge and that the Israelites were greatly outnumbered. The Song of Deborah elaborates on the gathering of the armies in Judges 5, 13-18. She indicates that Ephraim, Benjamin, and West Manasseh, which she called Machir, all sent men to fight. 
Reuben, Asher, Dan, and Gad, which she called Gilead, did not respond to the call to battle. Judah and Simeon in the far south of Israel are not mentioned. Although other tribes sent men, the bulk of the army came from Naphtali and Zebulun. Judges 5.18 Zebulun was a people who despised their lives even to death, and Naphtali also on the high places of the field. When the armies were in their places, Deborah signaled that it was time to descend from Mount Tabor and go to battle. The Lord would go before them. Judges 4.14-15 4, then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. The Song of Deborah describes how God used the Kishon River to defeat Sisera and his army. Judges 5, 19-22 The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Ta'anak, near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought from heaven. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on with strength. Then the horse's hoofs beat from the dashing, the dashing of his valiant steeds. Deborah relates that the stars fought from heaven, indicating that the powers of heaven fought on the side of Israel. The waters of the Kishon River swept away Sisera's 900 chariots. The NIV Study Bible comments on the site of the battle. For the battle site, Sisera cleverly chose the Valley of Jezreel along the Kishon River, whereas chariot forces would have ample maneuvering space to range the battlefield and attack in numbers from any quarter. But that was his undoing, for he did not know the power of the Lord who would fight from heaven for Israel with storm and flood as he had done in the days of Joshua. This battle is also similar to God's actions at the Red Sea when Pharaoh's chariots were swept away by the returning waters of the sea. Miriam, echoing the words of Moses, sang a song exalting God's victory over Pharaoh's army. Exodus 15:21. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. After the defeat at Kishon River, Sisera fled all the way back to his home base at Harosheth Hagoyim. The location of Harosheth Hagoyim is unknown. Some maps place it near the mouth of the Kishon River, just downriver from the battle. However, it may have been somewhere between Hatzor and Kadesh, because when Sisera arrives at his home base, he goes to the encampment of Eber, which we learned in Judges 4.11 was near Kadesh. Judges 4.17 However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Yael, the wife of Abair the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin king of Hazor and the house of Abair the Kenite. Abair's wife Yael went out to meet Sisera. She invited him into her tent, offered him a blanket so he could rest, and gave him fermented milk to drink. After he drank, he lay down to sleep. Judges 4.21 then Yael, Eber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. The fermented drink would have ensured that the exhausted Cicero would quickly fall asleep. Since he had taken refuge in a tent belonging to a woman, no one would think to look for him there. After Sisera fell asleep, Yael killed him using a hammer and a tent peg. The laws of hospitality would normally have forbidden Yael to take such action. However, her husband, Eber's first allegiance, should have been to the house of Israel. The Jewish sage Malban comments that the ancient Kenite allegiance to Israel superseded their more recent treaty with Jabin. 
Also, because Yael, as a woman, could not make a covenant, the fact that she took Sisera into her tent, not her husband's tent, suggests that her actions did not actually invoke the laws of hospitality. In further support of Yael's actions, Deborah's song extols Yael's act of killing Sisera right after the song mentions that the angel of the Lord cursed the city of Moroz, which did not answer Barak's call to join in the fight against King Jabin. Judges 5, 23 and 24. Curse Moroz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed among women is Yael, the wife of Eber the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. Placing the curse and the blessing back to back sets them in opposition to each other. Moroz is cursed because it did not come to the help of the Lord. Yael is blessed because she did come to the help of the Lord. Deborah, or perhaps the angel of the Lord, calls Yael most blessed among women. The art scroll commentary on Judges relates a midrash on the expression most blessed among women. According to the Midrash, this term alludes to the matriarchs and the women of the generation of the Exodus. They should bless her because all their efforts to build the Jewish nation would have been in vain had Yael not ended Sisera's mortal threat to Israel. The only other woman who receives this blessing is Mary, the mother of Yeshua. Interestingly enough, it is an angel, Gabriel, who speaks the blessing to Mary. Luke 1, 28. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. If we apply the reasoning of the Midrash to Mary, all the efforts of the matriarchs and the women of the generation of the Exodus would have been in vain if Mary had not accepted the honor of bearing the Messiah. Now, back to the book of Judges with Barak in pursuit of Sisera. When Barak arrived at the camp of Eber, Yael revealed that she had killed Sisera. Judges 4.22 and then as Barak pursued Sisera, Yael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with a peg in his temple. The narrative account ends with the declaration that God subdued Jabin and that the Israelites grew stronger until they finally destroyed him. Judges 4, 23 and 24. And on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the sons of Israel. And the hand of the sons of Israel went on and pressed hard against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. God subdued Jabin when he destroyed Jabin's army at the Kishon River. Afterwards, the armies of Israel continued to fight until King Jabin was destroyed. Afterwards, Deborah wrote a song commemorating the victory. Both she and Barak sang the song together. Judges 5, 1 through 3. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. In the Hebrew Bible, the Song of Deborah is written with two outer columns with a third column down the middle. This is the same format as the Song of the Sea. In the Song of the Sea, these columns represent the children of Israel safely passing on dry ground between the waters of the Red Sea gathered on either side of them. The Song of Deborah is deliberately connected to the Song of the Sea by the use of this structure. God destroys Sisera's army the same way he destroyed Pharaoh's army. Like the events at the Red Sea, God is the one who subdued Sisera and strengthened the army of Israel to defeat Jabin. As the song of Deborah concludes, Deborah gives us a glimpse of Sisera's mother. She stands in contrast to Deborah, who is a mother in Israel, and Yael, who kills Sisera. Deborah's title, Mother in Israel, is used only here in Judges 5 and in 2 Samuel 20.19, where it is used in reference to a city seeking justice. 
King David's general Joab is attacking a city because a traitor to David has taken refuge there. A wise woman of the city comes out to question why Joab is seeking to destroy the whole city, which she calls a mother in Israel. This wise woman then coordinates the efforts of the city to seek out and kill the traitor. Deborah stands as a mother in Israel to seek out and remove the threat to Israel that comes from within the land. Yael is like the wise woman in the city who kills the traitor who sought refuge in the city. Together, Deborah and Yael preserve the nation of Israel. In opposition to them, Sisera's mother stands at the window and waits in vain for Sisera to return in victory. Judges 5.28 The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? A woman watching at a window was a common image of the goddess in the Canaanite religion. This scenario of a woman looking out a woman appears only three times in the Bible. Each time the woman is opposing God's will and experiences suffering because of it. Deborah closes her song with praise for God's victory over his enemies. Judges 5.31 Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So the land had rest for forty years. King Jabin of Hatzor ruled over Israel for twenty years. His reign threatened the existence of Israel. God used Deborah the bee and Yael the mountain goat to bring victory to Israel and preserve the land of milk and honey. The significance of this victory rates on the same scale as the victory over Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. God miraculously delivered Israel and defeated his enemies, and the land had rest for 40 years. I'm Brenda Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.